Good morning, everyone. My name is Lana Cromwell, and I'm your presenter today on the topic of the top 10 tips for hybrid live modality and traditional modality. I wish to welcome everyone to this session and to say welcome to you all. I was born and raised actually in Canada. So that is in Canadian, which is welcome. Ha ha ha. So saying hello to everybody and welcome to the Forum for Excellence. So I was born and raised in Nova Scotia. I'm the baby of nine and I am the first generation college. So it, um, education has been a large part of my life for a long time. And I'm now, currently I'm the Associate Dean of Adult Education at Olive Harvey City College of Chicago. Uh, prior to that, I was the an ESL professor at uh, Malcolm X College, also City College of Chicago. I also, while I was there, I was an instructional mentor, which means I was assisting other faculty with um, content and um, giving suggestions. And um, basically, I was a support person for the other instructors. I was also a faculty development trainer in which I provided a lot of um, professional development, particularly on um, using Brightspace which is part of what I'm going to be talking about today. I am uh, I was a teacher from, from pre-K right to college level. I've taught for 23 years in the classroom. I've also been an educational consultant um, and also I've been a um, uh, trainer as well for other educational prom companies. So I've been in education 33, actually it's 33 plus years now. And I'm also an English as a second language specialist. So, um, fun fact about me, I do not like chocolate, but yes, I am human. I also don't really care for ice cream. So I did some research about people who do not like chocolate because it's always such a big shock to everybody. Uh, and the research told me that the percentage of people in the world who do not like chocolate is so small that it's not worth calculating. So there we go. So I'm gonna jump right into talking about this, uh, this topic. So. I get very excited when I talk about this because I've had a lot of success with it and I've had a lot of fun. And as you'll see, I'm gonna talk about using the learning management system, but in particular, I've used Brightspace. So the goal of this session is to provide you educators with some successful tips and strategies to enable yourselves as well as the students to adapt to the hybrid live modality, but also to, um, to the traditional modality as well. So I am um, an ESL educator, as I mentioned, now I'm a Dean, but this, uh, this session is going to allow you to adapt it to any subject matter and it's also useful for the blending learning of both synchronous and asynchronous requirements while creating a warm engaging environment and you're also going to hear from my students who had the experience in the hybrid live learning environment and also the um, in-person as well and we were able to use the use the skills actually simultaneously so you'll see that as we go on so I love to always show this picture here because um, when we first started, uh, when I first started with um, uh, City Colleges, I actually was asked to be a, um, a hybrid trainer about maybe three or four weeks into the job. And I said, yes, I'd love to always try something new. So I said, sure, I'll be a hybrid live training trainer. Little did I know I was going to be using it a short few months later when we had the unexpected um, time in our lives when the world was kind of on fire with COVID. So our dean, uh, who was Jamil Steele at the time, who was now at um, City College at Malcolm X, he, you said this, showed us a picture and said that we are building the plane while trying to fly it. And we all have a piece. So this is kind of what we felt like. He would come in every week. We had a, he had come in and called a temperature check. So he'd get all the faculty together. We'd be on Zoom and he would check in to see how we were feeling. Well, this is how we were feeling. And it was a very good description. So I always like to use that. Um, my students and I all kind of felt like this, and it was such a great description. It really set off our very first day of, uh, of doing the, um, uh, during COVID, when we had to do the uh, online Zoom classes. This is what I use for our students to kind of put it all at ease that, yes, we all feel the same way. So I'm going to focus on today, creating the classroom family environment. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the use of breakout rooms, which are my favorites. We're gonna talk about the discussions. That's a feature that's built in Brightspace, but almost every learning management system has this feature in some form or another for students to communicate together. I'm going to show you how to use discussions 
as an external resource to track external resources. So when you're using other websites, I'm going to show you how we use awards that are built into Brightspace. We're going to talk about assignments, text and files. We're going to show how I use assignments to track progress, how to send reminders to students. So it also focuses as a um, uh, the assignment reminders are built right into the Brightspace learning management system. We're going to talk about the efficient use of the class list feature. And then I'm going to talk about how I use Excel for the asynchronous assignment, which is always a tricky one. Uh, a lot of people have um, their own suggestions for it, but my one is just a bit simple. It's actually using um, paper, which I'll show you as we move on through the presentation. So engaging adult learners. I taught, um, I started teaching um, ESL pre-K actually to four-year-olds. It was the most wonderful experience of my life. Um, as I've moved into, I went through teaching pre-K on to um, grade two, grade three, almost every grade level actually straight through. And when I got to adult learning, I thought, wow, this is great because a lot of the, the premise that I used for my teaching is also in for, is for adult learners. So I got this information from Key Lauren Littlefield from 2012 how to promote an adult's learning, adults' readiness to learn, create that safe, warm, welcoming environment. I'm gonna speak a lot about that because this has been the premise of my team forever. Create a culture of empathy, respect, approachability, authenticity, to collaborate on the diagnosis of those learning needs, collaborate and develop those learning objectives and instructional planning, and to ensure the practicality of all learning activities. You're going to see that demonstrated as we go through and as you hear from my students as well. Creating that safe, welcoming, and fun learning environment of a classroom family, extremely important to me. To me, that is the basis of teaching. Students will always feel comfortable when they feel that they are in a group where there is like-mindedness and where people are working together as a family. My first two class rules that I put on the board the very first day. So I'll just preface this by saying, I was teaching the transitional level of ESL, which means my students were at a very advanced level. Um, they were fantastic, uh, had really good reading and comprehension skills, but not so much with speaking and listening. So we focused a lot on it for at least the first two to three weeks. We developed all the skills, but we really focused on those two. And I told the students right away, breathe easy and relax. I want you to take risks in this class. If you're not sure how to say it, say it anyway because it's okay to make mistakes. And that is something that I say every class, and you're going to hear from one of my students who talks about that, that that was the biggest factor in making her feel at ease in the classroom. So how do I do that? I start with an icebreaker bingo. I did this hybrid live as well as in person. It's actually a bingo card with a number of questions where you find similarities and fun differences with each other. What do you do? In a breakout room, I put them in a breakout room and I had three or four people in a group. They would read through the questions and talk to each other and try to find similarities. And I would tell them, I want you to use each other's names. So they would practice using each other's names, the pronunciation and getting to know each other worked really well. So kind of informal, but yet formal because I always did a follow up with them later. It was amongst their peers and I also participated with them. So it became a really fun activity and I recommend this to everybody. What is it? It's how you get to know your classmates, as well as I had a get to know you classmates interview where the students would ask each other questions. So I would typically put two to three in a breakout room or in the classroom, I would put two or three in a group and I would get so everyone would get to interview someone and the other person listened in. So now we just don't have two people who are sharing. We've got three people. So you were engaging listening right away and also engaging your understanding and your speaking skills and right back to it's okay to take risks. It's okay to make mistakes during this interview process. So the student learning outcomes always is going to have teamwork for your students. That's something that we always emphasize. So in that breakout room, the students would share their information. They would also, most cases when I have them in a breakout room, there's usually a reporter in the group who's going to write up on the learning management system what they talked about in discussions. So the get to know you is an interview. So they would go to a discussion tab. The discussion feature allows students to share information amongst each other so they can read it and respond to one another. And that's their platform. So do I read it? Yes, I do, because it gives me some talking points for the students. If they have things in common, if there's something I think that the whole class needs to know, we would use that from the discussions tab. So I'll talk more about that as we go on. 
So this is what the icebreaker bingo looks like. Anyone who would like it, I have a copy of it, but there's also lots of these online. I'd encourage you to use it. They were great. Groups of three or four in the breakout room, take turns reading a tile. So if there was three people in a group, I would say the first person read question one to three, the next person read four to six, the next person read seven to nine. This could go on um, for one class or it could go in over four weeks. So typically I did it throughout a week because I had the students to change groups. Then when we were finished, we shared out in a large group. That took approximately, every time I did group changes with the students as well, they all got to be in the group with everyone in the class at some point. At the end, when we were in a large group, we shared things that were funny or things we had in common or things we found out. And one quick little tidbit, I actually had a, a funny story. I had um, two students in the class who found out that they were actually distant relatives from Mexico. So we started talking about different things, where they were from. So it became a very interesting activity. As you can see, there's a lot of great topics here, like favorite pizza topping, um, who has curly hair, um, who loves to dance. So these, this is a great icebreaker, and it can be well used for discussions, for helping the students get to know each other. Highly recommend it the first day. Breakout rooms became my favorite. I love them. When I found that we could use these, I used them excessively. The one thing I did when we had the breakout room, give the students permission to socialize. We are social creatures. Before they jump in the task, I tell them, it's okay if you socialize. So this became quite a um, quite a funny, um, it was quite a funny line for them because they would, I would come into the breakout room and they're still talking. I would say, hmm, still socializing? They'd say, socializing, Ms. Cromwell, but we're getting on task. So this was actually a lot of fun, but I did give the students at least two minutes to socialize. I would drop in each breakout room and say, hey, how's it going? Walk around to the students and talk with them, but they need that time to socialize and you'll find it is well worthwhile. It's two to three minutes well spent. I gave the students the time to practice without the teacher present. They enjoy that. Yes, they like when the teacher would pop in, but they prefer when they were in there on their own, just chit-chatting and being able to make mistakes and take risks. It was be kind of informal according to whatever my lesson plan objective might be. And um, we also gave them permission because they got to know each other really well. When they were in these breakout rooms, it was okay to correct each other because they're like a classroom family. So that was something that they did as well. And also they know in the breakout rooms, they could always ask for help because they have the button there where it says, click if you need help, I would drop in the room. So I made sure that I was always present when they were in the breakout rooms, but I did not stay in there too long because that is their time to talk, to take the risks and to make mistakes. Now, this is my student, Aida, who's going to talk about how we did that in our class. Hi, my name is Aida, and I have been studying English for several years now. However, when I moved to the United States, it turned out that my speaking skills were not good enough. Uh, by chance, I got into Miss Cromwell classroom, and honestly, I was and I am on cloud nine. I used to be very quiet and barely talking during first couple classes, but despite that, just in two weeks, I was joyfully discussing various topics with my classmate and my sensei. Moreover, if you are not much of a speaker, she will find a topic that you cannot stay away from. The friendly environment that she creates in a classroom helps my classmates and me feel relaxed and unchained. In addition to our time together, her marvelously designed asynchronous assignments that based on challenges that we face during the class time reinforce what we have learned. That's what makes it so special. And I really appreciate the amount of efforts Ms. Cromwell puts in her work. Thank you for your time. So that is my wonderful student, Aida, from Russia. When she came to me, she was extremely quiet. Now, when I first came to my uh, my teaching position at Malcolm X, I took over for someone who had a promotion. So it was really taking over someone else's class. And I bonded with that group. But this group that came around in January, this was my first class that I had completely on my own. Aida was one of those students who came in who was extremely quiet. She did not say anything. After we did the icebreaker and we had certain topics, she loosened up and was able to express herself. She was also um, a chosen to speak at a conference um, in Chicago. We did not know this was going to be a large forum. We thought she was just going to, they asked if I had a student who I would like to come speak and talk about their experience in ESL. 
Well, Aida, we thought it was just going to be a very small um, session with maybe just some students and a few teachers. It actually ended up being something very large and um, she did an excellent job. I was very proud of her. I went there to support her and it was wonderful. So going to talk about discussions. So the students do a PowerPoint presentation called All About My Culture. Again, creating that warm classroom environment and using that discussions feature in your learning management system. The PowerPoint would include home country, their goals, their hobbies, um, pictures of their family. And then at the end, students were allowed to give comments and questions to each other. So this went on for about 15 minutes. I would record their PowerPoint presentation and then I would put it under, I would upload it into discussions right in Brightspace and they could go back and watch it. They could talk, they could um, go online and they would ask each other questions. They would comment and say, hey, I've been to your country before. So this was something that my students loved. So the asynchronous portion was continuing that communication with the PowerPoint. So students who may not have had a question, uh, a chance to ask the questions live were able to continue that using the informal discussion tab in the learning management system. And in there, when you contribute to a discussion, they also could get an award, which I will talk about at towards the end. This was something the award is giving automatically because they click on a tab, but as the teacher in Brightspace, you have to set that up. Very encouraging for students. I also use discussions as a way to track students who worked on outside resources. So for instance, there's noredink.com. That's a grammar site. Commonlit.org, we probably all know that. But when you are in a learning management system, these are not part of that system. So how would your students know what to do? I would go to discussions and say, when you have completed No Red Ink as part of your asynchronous homework, go to discussions, they would see it there. I would tell them, please write complete when you have finished No Red Ink. So in order to keep track of their homework, I put this in discussions and I would tell the students sometimes, just write done. So they would write done because the discussion tab would say complete no red ink or complete common lit. They would do it. So I find, so for me, what I have found when students write something, they remember to do it a lot better than if they don't do anything at all. So in order to get them to complete that homework, I always set it up at the discussion tab. They got an award that would say, hey, this has been completed. And sometimes what I did, so when I got right done in your first language, so students, of course, became very used to this after a while. So then I would get a little bit tricky. And I would say to them, um, when you have finished No Red Ink, write done in your first language. Or I might say, write it in your classmate's first language. So they would have to go into that discussion tab and see where someone wrote it in Japanese or someone wrote it in Italian or someone wrote it in Russian. And they would have to complete it that way. So that was something I did to make sure that they were using the, hind to, the head, heart to hand of making sure they get it done and also paying attention to the directions and reading each other's comments. So that's the way that I use that discussion tab. And the students actually love this because they would go back and say, oh, I forgot, I just wrote done. Okay, let's go on. So this is a comment from my student, Juliana. She was a student from Brazil, wonderful student, but she did not want to do a, um, a video. She said she'd like to write something because she was so pleased with how well she had done with her writing skills. So I'm not going to read this to you just for time's sake, but I would like you to pause the video if you're watching this online and read this because she tells a really very compelling and heartfelt story. And I'll just kind of sum it up. Juliana really loved the learning about other people's cultures. She felt it really helped her get to know her classmates and to understand more about them and give her something to talk about. So she also talked about um, uh, when she moved here with her, her husband, he came here for work and they had a, a big event happening at Navy Pier and it was a very fancy place. And she was quite nervous as to how she was going to interact with her husband's um, coworkers and his colleagues. And when she went there, she actually said she felt so comfortable because she had had enough practice and she was able to take risks. She wasn't worried about making mistakes. So please read through this. And she, um, she talks about growing her confidence and her ability to ask questions and how she just felt very rewarded being there because she had had so much good practice in class. So again, I encourage you to read this, this um, from Juliana. So these are the awards that I spoke about. So these awards are built into Brightspace. So they are part of the learning management system. So after student completes something, 
These awards have to be set up by the teacher that says, if a student clicks on, maybe it's discussion on the student's presentation, they'll automatically get an award that I set up that might say, um, great contributor or discussion master. So I could choose which ones I wanted. So each semester though, in Brightspace, you have to import them each term. So you can also, as a teacher, create your own. Brightspace has some built in. I create a lot of my own. They're very encouraging for my students and they love them. So the award, again, it depends on you as the teacher. It's something extra, but it is very rewarding. No pun intended. The students really like these, and I suggest that teachers use them, engage these. The students, they're rewarding for them, and they quite enjoy them. So this is what they look like in Brightspace. So over here, on the, you go into Course Admin, you click on it, and up here at the top, it's going to say Class Awards. Typically, they're built in. The class list, these are all of my students, and I think that top one actually was Aida. And as you can see, she was a very good student. She clicked on a lot of the content and completed it, and she got these badges. It alerts the students that they've got the badge, and the student is able to accumulate these, and they quite like them. So this first one that you see here, I think this was, was team player. So this means that they uh, contributed to a group discussion of some sort. This blue book here, this was actually something that I use an outside resource called ReadWorks. So when they clicked on ReadWorks, they got a book. So I could look at it very quickly and say, oh, these people did ReadWorks. This one, someone down here maybe did not. Um, the little funny face here, this was completing an activity on using idioms. So these were badges that I added for the students and they quite like them. I'm going to go to Brightspace and show you these at the end of this session. Then we have our assignments. So what are the assignments? Discussions students can see on their, they can see them together and use them, click on them and read each other and interact. Assignments are actually just private for the teacher. So these were something that I would tell my students, when you get an assignment, that is something that only I can see. Your classmates will not see your assignments. So this is something that is personal for just you and I, they can either be, um, it's either gonna be a text or it's gonna be a file upload. I spent a lot of time using these and explaining them. Because if they are not explained well, students don't understand. And as the teacher, you have to determine, do you want it to be a text assignment, which is very simple, very short responses. It could be formal or informal. Typically, it's kind of informal. So my text submission the first day was something like, um, please text right here when, uh, when is your birthday or what is your favorite color? So the students would do that as a text submission. However, the file submission they actually have to go into documents. They have to create a file. They have to learn how to name it and upload it. Typically it's used for essays or summaries or some kind of formal writing. I, it also has, um, I can grade it and I can correct it. I also use it as a free writing tool. So sometimes at the beginning of class, I would say, okay, everyone go to assignments and I would have it set up. This is going to be free writing for 10 or 15 minutes. This is something that I highly recommend that you do, especially, well, with any students in adult ed. But in ESL, I used it because I wanted my students to see their progress from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. Of course, assignments are dated. I can see when they submitted it. And I can actually write on the document. So I would get them at the beginning of our course to start to, to write something, just free write. And then come back at the end of the session, end of the um, the eight weeks or the 16 weeks and compare it. And they could say, wow, look at my progress. And this is what it looks like. So in the learning management system, learning management system, you can choose your assignments again, either text or um, upload. This is an upload of a document. The features are all right here at the top. So what you see here, this is a speech bubble that I clicked here and pulled this down. This is a, I'm sorry, a sticky note. And I wrote on here, you know, spelling error. I could just grab this and pull it down. There's also a text box. So there are several features that you can use in here. You can print it off for your students if you like. You can take this pen and cross out something like I did over here. I put a blue line through this because she didn't need that. So this is a tool that is fantastic. It may not seem so at the time when you're using it. It's a bit, uh, it's a lot, but it is very advantageous for your students. So you have the sticky notes here. 
You can choose a text box to write in it if you want to, and you just click on it, and it'll stay there for the students. And then over here on the side, you can grade it. And this goes into a grade book that's on assignments as well. You can also write in here, Aida, this was a fantastic piece of writing. I appreciate learning more about your country. Um, you know, there are maybe three or four errors. Please correct them and I'll come back. So you can do this as well with your students. Down here at the bottom, email users without submissions. That's the other great thing about assignments. Let's say if you assign, give an assignment on Monday and you expect it to be completed on Friday, you can send a reminder to students who have not submitted something. You can click their name and it just automatically it goes to students who have not submitted. You don't have to choose anything. It automatically will send it to those students who did not have a submission yet. So I would typically send that out on the day before the assignment was due just as a reminder. Also down here, if you look at the bottom right here, it has record audio. You can record an audio for your students, a re recorded message, or you can do a recorded video and they can do the same for you. So just know that these are two great features that the students liked. So I'd have to remind them when they were doing a recorded video, I would tell them, you know, this is not America's top model audition. You just have to come on here and speak. And it just gave them a chance to kind of see themselves at the beginning of the semester and see their progress throughout the rest of the year. And we had a lot of fun with this. So this is um, my student, um, Atande, who's going to speak to you about her experience in um, the ESL transition class. Hello. My name is Itande Solis, and I have been in Ms. Crumble's class for over a year. I would like to talk to you about how even though in the beginning I thought the hybrid class will be a little challenging, it ended up being a major surprise. In my opinion, one of the most important pieces of hybrid learning is the teacher, the way she makes you feel welcome in the classroom, her building a community with all of us, and taking the time to correct all of our homework has a significant impact on my learning. Brightspace have a, has a feature called assignments where you can submit a document as a homework. It is mostly a writing about a topic we learn in class. And when Ms. Cromwell corrected these assignments and gave me feed, feedback, it helped me to realize what I made my mistakes grammarly wise so I can improve it and use it in the future. And also we can resubmit the assignment multiple times and this is so helpful. Thank you. So Atande too was a um, very special student, um, very bubbly personality and um, just a really, really uh, um, a great student and really added so much to the class. Um, so a funny story about Atande that I'd like to share. She was working with a, um, a leasing company and she would send off um, emails to her boss. And her boss told her, she told her boss, you know, I'm really unsure about my language skills, but I'm going to go to class. I'm going to go take an ESL class. You know, I've been here a long time. And her boss told, oh, that's fine. Yes, just write an email. Just write it without punctuation. So, of course, when she told me it, I was like, oh, my goodness. No, you just can't write without punctuation. So as time went on, she said her boss said to her, wow, I really see your progress. I see you're using capital letters in the right place now. You're putting periods. You're doing great punctuation. So that was a funny story that she shared with us. And um, we were very proud of Atande. She made a lot of, um, a lot of great progress. Okay. So talking a little bit more about assignments, what are the benefits of assignments? They help you to track the progress. I say this because some people kind of stay away from using assignments because they're quite lengthy to grade, but I tell you, they're so easy when you use those tools. I highly recommend that you use it as free writing for that first few weeks of class. Students have the time writing on various topics. So I would say, um, let's say at um, 10 o'clock every day, every second day, I would say, okay, we're going today we're going to write about... Um, um, for 10 minutes, I want you to just write about your weekend. So we would be on Zoom. I would tell them you can turn your cameras off, or leave them on, or in the classroom, I would just set the timer and they could see the timer ticking down. And this was just free writing time for them where they could just feel free to make errors. But typically at the end of the semester or somewhere in here, we would get up here to go in and edit it. Or sometimes I would get them to go back a week later and edit it and see if they could see where they made mistakes and what they've learned now with a comparison of where they were then and where they are now. They could see their progress typically even in a couple of weeks. So again, I like that end of semester comparison of before and after writing samples. 
And they could, um, and the other thing that I had them to do was count your errors from your first semester, from the first assignment, and then compare it to your final assignment. Huge difference. And they love this. So in your classroom, I highly recommend that foster that classroom community by honoring your students' experience. Students come with various sets of skills. Um, as we know, we have a lot of professionals in our classroom who may not be able to work in their career path, but certainly have a lot to share. When students have that classroom, that warm, friendly classroom environment, they're happy to share these. So in most cases, my students would talk about being a doctor in their country, and now they're, they're um, doing something else, or... Um, that they want to change careers now that they're here in, in America. So always honoring and acknowledging your student expertise, I think is very, is key to also creating that environment. That all about me presentations, beautifully. The students really, really like to have this time to share and talk about themselves. They show pictures of their family. So I really um, recommend always honoring your students experience. And when it's done within context in class. So for instance, Aida was a doctor in Russia. So when we were talking about medicine, I would engage her and also we had Samani and um, uh, Ahilio who were also, the three of them were doctors. So they would get together and share medical experiences with us. We would talk about students who have perhaps had good tech skills or students, I had a lot of accountants. So we talked a lot about accounting as well. So it helps to know your students so you can always make that connection with them. And I would often give them time to sit together and talk in groups and talk about the experiences in your country in the same field, but how they were similar and how they were different. And now you're going to hear from Alejandra who talks about this using her skills in class with her classmates. Hello, my name is Alejandra Romero. I'm from Colombia and I'm also a part of the ESL classroom family. Um, and here I've been able to improve my skills, my English skills, and also my confidence. So today I want to tell you how this has been happening. So for me, um, I've been able to use my skill as a teacher back in Colombia, and I think I have a little bit of knowledge with technology. So I've, I've been a classmate of people with a lot of ages, young and older. So I know with this new era, it's been a little um, difficult for people to connect with technology. So. Um, Ms. Trommel and I, have, we've been working with that because, you know, as a student, sometimes it's easier to see an equal um, to go with, to answer those questions that sometimes you're afraid to ask to the teacher. So for me, I think that's been really helpful to um, create the bonding family, the bonding situation, the loving, caring environment in the class which is really great because in a family, you help each other. So, and that way we connect more. Um, we are all part of different countries, being part of the ESL class. So also by helping you connect during the activities, during the discussions that I'm sure another classmate is going to talk. So, um, being able to connect in that way, in that level, it'd be really helpful to practice and feel more confident while you do it. Thank you. So that is the wonderful Alejandra, who was a uh, teacher back in her country, and she came with very good technology skills. So often Alejandra, I would put her in a breakout room with a student who might need connections with them, um, connecting to their student portal, or, um, uh, reviewing some kind of tech skill. So I was able to, she was able to use her technology skills to help her classmates. And she did a beautiful job. She did a really great job. We were sorry to see her go back to her country, but um, she's a great example of being able to use your skills and feel proud of what she can do. And she also did some, I did some work with her on her own and helped her to use some, have some advanced training. And then she passed it on with her classmates. And of course she spoke Spanish. So she was able to um, she could speak in her first language when she had to share that information with her students. So she did kind of both. She did dual language training with the classmates and she was wonderful help. So the class list in Brightspace, that is another feature that's right across the top. So in Brightspace, we have all of these different features and class list is one. You can use it as a reminder for students to complete their asynchronous homework. You just go to the class list, 
You can click one button that says all, or you can click each student individually and send the messages. So there's also announcement features that you can use, but I preferred to use the class list because I could send it to a group of students who needed it, or I could also send it individually. So students and instructors can, I used it for to communicate, to follow up with their, um, their breakout room discussions. So I would say, hey, we talked about, so maybe after work, I would decide, and after class was over, I think I'd like them to write about what we talked about today, about um, um, what Valentine's Day means in their country, if they have one, or what Halloween is like, or the Day of the Dead, what this all means. So I would send that to the students and say, hey, please go to the break, go to the, um, and follow up to the breakup room discussion today on blah, 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 please contribute to the discussion. So this helped the students to continue to create that classroom environment. And that class list was extremely helpful just to send out those quick messages to the students. So one of the activities that we used was called describing a picture. So I use this actually in the online class. So people will always ask me, how did you do that? I would send the picture. So I would choose students, I'd put them in pairs, two students, or sometimes three if it was an odd number. I would send the picture through email to one student. I would give them time to go to their email, find the picture. Only they could see the picture in their email and they had to describe it to their partner in a breakout room. So while they're in a breakout room, the partner is looking at the picture on their email. The other person cannot see it, but they're describing it to the person. So students actually were getting their own flow with this. So they would start with, okay, well, I'm gonna start with naming the big objects first. I'm gonna start with naming the small objects first. So one funny story we had with this, the Tande was working with her uh, classmate, um, uh, Luciano, and she looked at the picture on the wall and said, um, Atande is a big fan of, of horror movies, much that I am not. And um, she said there was a look like there was a spooky woman in the window here. Well, Luciano came when they came out of the breakout room. We were talking about the picture and showed it. He said, Atande pointed out something really strange. And we all laughed and laughed. So she forever became the person who talked about the spooky woman in the window, because right here, no one really pays attention to this in the picture. But it's surprising to what students pay attention to. So this was a great activity. We would ask the students to, um, one of the things that we worked on was tone, mood, all of that. They would look at this and say, hey, what's the tone? What's the mood? How can you tell? So these describing pictures activities were wonderful. When I did this in the traditional hybrid class and I had the students in person, I would have this on the screen behind them, this picture, and students would be sitting, the students who was going to draw were sitting with their back to the screen the students who were describing it, of course, would be facing the screen and they could not turn around. So I would have this all set up ahead of time. The students love this activity. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you want to know more about it, I'm happy to, to share it with you. I'm going to give you my email and my phone number after. So if you want more um, direction on this, you can choose almost any kind of picture. It's a lot of fun for the students and really helps them improve the vocabulary, especially prepositions where we know they're going to have difficulty. The teapot is on the table, or sometimes they called it the kettle is in the table. So very, very good for prepositions. Then this brings me to the end with talking about the Excel spreadsheet. So why am I talking about Excel? Because it was a great way for me to get a quick glance of completed assignments. So how did I use it? I had all my students' names over here on the left-hand side and I had their assignments for discussions, whatever it might be for the week, I put them all in an Excel spreadsheet. So this is the kind of me combining technology with paper, which I sometimes find the paper was just worked better for me. Now, I also did it also just on the computer tracking it, but this was a quick way for me to see who has done their homework and I use this key. If they complete the assignment, I just put a dot. If they, if it was graded, I put a check mark. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me go forward on, go back to this one. If it needed revising, I put an R. So let's say I'd go to correct an assignment, let's say at home in the evening, I come to class the next day and say, okay, um, three students, you need to revise no red ink, um, you know, Alejandra and uh, uh, Julio, you need to complete your, you need to go back and complete your discussions. Um, Aida has everything all completed. So whatever the case might be, it was easy for me to use this Excel spreadsheet to help track the students' asynchronous assignments. Yes, it can be done in learning management systems, but this was something that I found at a glance, it was just very helpful for me. 
So that brings us to the end of uh, my presentation. I thank you all for your time. I am happy to answer any questions or connect with anyone. My email is tcromwell at cc.edu. Why is it T? Because my first name is Tracy, but no one's ever called me Tracy. I've always been called Lana my entire life. So my email is tcromwell at cc.edu. And feel free to call my mobile if you would like to talk. I'd be happy to engage with anyone. So I thank you all. Have a wonderful conference. And thank you so much for your time.